Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, thank you very much. Another parallel uh, research talk. I'd like to introduce my colleague Natasha Millet Freiling, um, who is part of the Computer Mediated Living Group. There she leads the Integrated Systems Group and she will tell us about her research projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you very okay. much, Natasha. Thank you very much, Scarlett. Now, as well, Scarlett didn't tell you that I have a, uh, a secret agenda here. The objective of my talk really is to try to shock you. Now, if I don't succeed in shocking you, then I'm actually very happy because then you or know, know about all this that I'm going to tell you. It's really about um, the way that we design systems and the way that people experience systems and what they think systems are doing. And you have been probably aware of the privacy breaches and uh, surprises that people get when they realize that they're being part of an experiment or they are part of uh, sniffing around and uh, profiling and so on. But I don't think that that really message hits home until you see the empirical data or what is actually going on. And so for today, I, I just picked one example, uh, which uh, represents a, a very uh, kind of, um, widely used application, which is a browser. And just to understand a little bit, what is it that people see, and what is it what actually happens behind, and what's the gap between the two? And uh, really, from the uh, computer science point of view, raises a big question about the transparency of design of computing systems and uh, the value exchange that we support when we are designing these systems. So the talk today is not going to in introduce any uh, dramatically new and interesting algorithms. They're going to be about empirical uh, evidence for um, transformation that's happened on the web and to make us think about how we should um, convey to the user interfaces to the people what actually is going on. So here I'm showing you, uh, this is a typical experience. So you go to a website, in this case is a New York Times website, and we call this normally a first party website because this is the site that you intended to go to. So you can imagine you as a user sort of have, you have a, a, in your mind a, a, an image of what your website is and who you are dealing with as an organization and what is the value you can get from them. Now what happens is also on that website there are the bits and pieces that you may not be aware of and those are the other uh, um, entities that are being involved, they're all filling the same page. So they are filling the same kind of real estate on the web with bits and pieces. And those other ones that are involved and people don't know about because they didn't intend to uh, engage with those sites, we call them third parties. So it's a simple kind of definition. First party is what you're intending to do, you think you're doing. And then third party are all other partners or other uh, yeah, companies involved uh, that are participating in the experience. Okay. Now, uh, I will now go straight to a demo that just show you what actually happens when you down on the web page. Um, I will switch to a demo uh, of an extension of uh, Firefox, where um, the objective really is to show you uh, what sort of things uh, through, say, cookies may happen on your computer. So I'm going to go to New York Times, the same company, and so. Just as you go to New York Times, uh, as soon as the page is loaded, you can see all these little bits coming off the screen, or the top of the screen just fell down. So these are all cookies that are right now downloaded on my computer. Now, among these cookies, there are some green ones, there are some red ones. Most of them are red, uh, red ones now, I'll explain in a minute. But each bar represents a domain. So the green uh, bar here actually represents the cookies that were downloaded on my computer right now from New York Times. And if you go to New York Times, you can go and talk to them and they'll say, yes, I do need all these cookies because the site needs to work. And if you click on this, uh, you will actually see this is the list of all the cookies they needed for site to work. And you can say, okay, this is fine. You need it to work. And I'm all, I'm all right with this, but I don't really know what are these other domains go doing there, okay? So then you can start clicking on the other one. So the next one here is double click. So DoubleClick has only three cookies downloaded on my computer right now. But what's interesting is the list of uh, domains that are below that. It says, here in particular, it says one of uh, 103 other domains have the same cookies. So what you are seeing here now is the list of 
domains that somehow it got involved while I was browsing, while I browse on, online. Okay, so, so that means that the same three cookies that double click put when I accessed New York Times were put on all these other sites. And then you could ask yourself, what are the cookies and what are they doing? The simplest thing when I think about cookies is, it's like a badge, okay? If somebody puts a badge on me, so every time I go to a different site, I have a badge, and they kind of look at me and say, oh, okay, well, I, I recognize this badge, this is double click badge, and this person was on New York Times, and then the next time it was on EasyJet, and next time it was on, I don't know, PC World. So that, that badge stays with me. And whoever can pro for that badge can go and track me. Okay, so that's basically what's happening. Um, you're, you're on your computer, for the same reasons that you would need to communicate with websites um, in order to download the content, the, the websites are now probing into your computer and they're basically checking for these badges. Okay? And based on that information, they do what we call real-time tracking. And so we are now talking about milliseconds. We are now talking about milliseconds of collecting information and then providing that information for bidding. Okay. So um, I will now show you another um, um, uh, little prototype that we built for visualizing networks. It's called Node Excel. So what we have done, we gave this tool to a number of people, seven or eight individuals, and they said, give us your logs after a week. Okay, and then we're going to see who has been involved in tracking you. Okay, so I'll just show you a visualization of the tracking network for one person for seven days. And I'll just show you how, it, how basically we, we analyze it. So here it is. This is a network that was um, um, created based on links between a website and uh, the party, the third party that the website referred to. So the links here are from the green dots. You see, you see them here. The green dots are all the website that the person visited. And then the links towards the uh, red nodes are the links that happen once you load the page. And then in HTML, there is this, um, um, there's a link um, a referral, basically, where you can refer to another party when the page is loaded. And I'll just show you how example how it works. So suppose you went to uh, Forbes.com, here's Forbes.com, and that very moment when you are engaged with Forbes, uh, these other, other parties get involved. Okay? Now, uh, some of these are red, some of them are purple, and I'll explain in a minute what it is. But say uh, this Forbes is pointing to double click, then you click on double click, and then you can see which other websites have been connected with double click. Okay, so a little bit about the structure of the, of the uh, network. So um, pointer from A to B means that uh, a node A referred to node B. So in this case, most of the green sites are pointing to the, the trackers. And then the trackers, some of the trackers would point to other trackers. And uh, that is, for example, a double click node. So there are a number of these links going in from green websites, and then, and then they point to the red ones because they're basically a broker. So as soon as a signal comes from the website, they pass information to the bidders, and then the bidding happens in exchange, and then, of course, the flow goes back, and you, you deploy the advertisements. Okay. Um, somebody like a purple note is slightly different. Okay. Um, in, for this note, you only have in-links. Those are the links from the website going straight to the, say in this case, is uh, uh, Google Analytics. And there are no necessarily links going from Google an uh, Analytics outwards. That means that the web that website is not necessarily a broker, but it's just a collector of information. And so in, in this case, these sort of um, a, a different third parties, we know there are different roles. Um, it just in, in this case, it happens that the tracking across websites and tracking within the site are done by two entities and they both belong to the same uh, company. They both belong to Google. Now, there are other instances where you have, uh, have Facebook.com and Facebook.net, and they have similar, um, a similar relationship. So one is tracking within the site, another one is tracking across sites. Uh, 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 so, um, the whole analysis here is done basically, uh, simply based on a network analysis. Of course, in order to verify that what I'm saying is correct, you need to go outside and then look at the business models and uh, look at the whole ecosystem. But the fundamental question here for us is, um, this is all invisible, and yet it is done in plain sight. That's why I call this talk. It's in plain sight. It's right in front of you. I showed you the web page. They're all there. It's just you can't, you can't really, 
you don't understand what it means. Okay? And the value proposition now is, well, we're delivering you information. Uh, we are not telling you we are basically doing that info, uh, better delivery information because we are tracking you. And in this particular case, the reason why the trackers are there is because of the business models. The trackers are not there randomly. They actually have contract. They have contractual agreements with the green dots, with the websites. So each of these websites actually signed a contract with DoubleClick, with Google uh, Analytics, and others. And these contracts are based on some value proposition. It may be that, say, Google Analytics may come and say, we will tell you exactly what's happening on your website. You'll be able to improve your website. You'll get better traction with your customers. And DoubleClick may come in and say, we have fantastic marketing campaigns. We can show your advertisements across the whole web. You're not restricted just on your website. Okay? And so uh, essentially, the, th uh, the first parties, the, the website themselves, may or may not understand the mechanism. But the value proposition to them is exploit the internet eyes, explore the people who are visiting, and you will be, have a better exposure. In all this, the saddest part is that consumers, you and I, are outside this network. We are sitting right outside, right here. We are trotting over these green dots, and we are being yeah, tracked. Yeah. So in this value exchange, we don't have a say. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, when, when, we are, when somebody is claiming the benefit of this network, nobody asks us. In fact, the advertisers would claim to make their own claims. They'll say, well, this is because our customers want better advertisements. And I want to know who of you ever asked any, any of these websites to put advertisements there. So in a way, they're claiming they're giving us be a benefit for something that we never asked. Okay, I just find that argument very, very interesting. Okay. So um, I will now switch to, uh, back to the presentation just to show you some of the type of analysis that you as a computer scientist uh, would probably would do uh, just to understand a little bit of the nature of this network. Um, and also to understand what is the exposure of us individuals, consumers, um, when we are using very simple services like search or Twitter, just to understand a little bit more um, what is the statistics behind. Okay, so let me just go back. Any questions at this stage? People were aware of this or <laughs> are shocked a bit as well? Probably. Yeah, that was my objective. <laughs> I, I was really hoping that I wouldn't shock them much, but... <laughs> Um, as I said, it, it just hits home when you see the numbers, and that's why our job is, believe me, there is nobody under the sun, nobody in the world that can actually tackle this but you. Nobody. Nobody understands it. We created computer, computer technologies, we put it there, uh, and you know, you know how it, it goes. Uh, it can be used in various ways. Whatever you invent, it will be used, and it depends on which hands gets into. And we, computer scientists, we understand this, we understand this technology. It is really in our hands to um, I wouldn't say fix it, but understand why this has happened and then understand if you don't like it, if you do not like it or if citizens don't like it, what is it that we can do? The, 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 the answer is probably not just, you know, try to uh, kind of uh, cut off the internet. You are not going, we, nobody can do this. The question is, if you understood why it happened, then we can try to um, um, introduce perhaps other technologies or uh, other practices that would empower more citizens in this case. Yeah. So it isn't one reason that I'm, I expect to browse the internet and for example read the New York Times for free. I don't want to yeah. pay for it and then the price uh, uh, I pay is basically the advertisements and the tracking. Exactly. So if that's the case, uh, the, um, uh, it, the question is only whether that value proposition was presented and whether it was accepted as such. Yeah, so, so everybody is happy to get things for free. And if they think they are getting it for free, uh, they may accept it. Okay. Uh, to be sure, so the cookie is taken by the website which I'm visiting, and then by that website it is sent to further uh, domains. And so the way it works is that you end up, uh, say, on the New York Times, and then there is an HTML um, over the web page, there's a referral. And as soon as the page is loaded, the referral is going to, say, double click or Google Analytics and uh, Yields Manager and so on, and they mm -hmm. then place the cookie on. As a, basically, the cookie comes with the advertisement, basically. Whatever they put on the page then actually gets loaded and, and stored in your uh, cookie cache. So you think you have a one-to-one -one relationship, yes. but as but soon exactly, as you load, there are multiple you have parts end coming sites in. Uh, uh, being all um, pointed to your computer. Yes. I mean, depending on how it works, I can, uh, if it is 
sent to the website, uh, which I'm using, and then it sends to further websites, then I guess I cannot prohibit the website that I'm using from doing it, right? I yeah, really yeah, you can't. Them. Yeah, so I, I can now show you. Just discuss a little bit of what browser is allowing people to do. You can start blocking the download of um, uh, cookies from particular domains. So you can. Y y the browser has the ability to say, "Stop this! You can't put this on my computer." If I send the cookie to the website which I'm using, and then it forwards it, then I cannot. Uh, so you are not sending the PC is not uh, sending anything. Uh, PC just allows people to sniff. In. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I should comment a little bit on the design of a, um, yeah, I'll comment a little bit on the design of the interface. There was an attempt to help people understand exactly what you're saying and understand uh, what are the mechanisms that, by which they can act. Um, so just a little bit of a structure of the talk. What I just mentioned to you is I showed you an empirical study of the network and, and the particular um, interface in which it was a Firefox extension. And the idea between the, behind the design of this um, uh, prototype was to see what will be the people's reaction when you provide information to them in real time. So in, in, if you think about the design of the application that I just showed you, the cookies dropping off the top of the page, kind of shocking. Uh, 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 there are a there are num number of ways you can try to inform people about things. And we went all the way to the kind of real time. Uh, the, when we deployed and actually the study, it was very interesting because at the beginning, first couple of days, you don't even notice things. You could kind of, if you're not really paying attention, you won't even see these little drops because um, um, people are not going to the websites like New York Times. They were just going to Facebook, and on Facebook, you may have two of them. And so they didn't pay attention. So after we, when we interviewed them, they, 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 some of them said, yeah, yeah, we, we noticed some of these things dropping down, but we were not sure whether it's just part of the website. And, uh, you know, we never even thought about... Um, clicking on them. And they obviously didn't read the instructions that we gave them, but that was all realistic, so <laughs> this, is, this is all fine. Okay? This is exactly what people would do. They won't read, and they won't do anything. So uh, in the interviews with them, the real thing, we could observe what happens from the initial discussion, what do you think about advertisements, what do you think about fa you know, free content, and so on, until we showed them the graph. And the graph was, oh, is that how it's done? And the second question is, and what can I do? And that was the sad part. You know, we didn't really, at the time, we didn't have anything to tell them what to do except get into private mode uh, uh, browsing. In, in private, in fact, you pay a price because in private means that you are not going to store anything locally on your computer, so you don't have your history anymore. So you, that immediately cuts on the benefits of, of other features. Um, and then... Um, in private would probably block most of the cookies. So that was a kind of a secondary effect. But really, we didn't have any solutions for them. So that was the discussion of the first. And in the rest of the talk, I will talk about two other um, studies that we have done. One was about exposure to trackers when you're doing search. And then just a little bit of awareness what happens when you, say, share URLs on Twitter. Because it's all basically the same thing. Um, before I go on with search, uh, let me just show you uh, the attempts from the browser design's point of view to help people deal with cookies. So this is typically what you get. You get a menu. If you know where it is, it normally is under the kind of some security, you know, privacy, privacy tag now. And um, in Microsoft browser, you have the slider. Basically, the, if you just think through a little bit more what the idea is, you have the idea that your privacy is on a slider kind of uh, scale. So you can say, I want more privacy or, or less privacy. I want medium or you know, high privacy. So, so this is very interesting as, a, you know, as a, if you're thinking about the design and you're conversing with people, what would that medium privacy mean to them? And then the similar thing you get on Firefox. Now, I'm not going to critique Firefox, I think, is not appropriate, so I, I just stick with uh, IE. And, and then just look a little bit what happened to me when I was, uh, after I found out about cookies in more detail, I said, okay, I'm going to bump up my privacy all the way to the top. So now I've got to block all the cookies. That's what I kind of understand. And, uh, and then I was curious what the advanced one was going to do for me, because this is kind of a standard one. So I went into the advanced tab uh, to see what I can do there, and that's gonna, where I got confused, because... Uh, the advance was showing 
accept, accept on the first party cookies and um, th third party cookies. You can see, kind of says accept, accept. And I just thought, I just thought I changed that. Yeah. So the only way I can now interact with this one is by actually saying override automatic cookie tracking. And now I don't know really what is automatic, what's not automatic. I just put the thing on to the top. I see that I'm accepting cookies. What do I do next? Yeah. So, so anyway, so, so basically I realized that the only way I can now interact with this one is by overriding something, which I don't know what I'm over overriding. Okay. All right, so uh, just a little bit more, but uh, what would the user do when thinking about these different mechanisms and not understanding what they're doing? And then the, the worst thing was uh, I, I went back then to check what, what the wording was about this. And, and, and then just if you read the wording, it says, block 30 party cookies that do not have a compact privacy statement. And, you know, now I'm a completely lost because I have not heard about any, you know, compact privacy policy. I have not heard about any policy because nobody had informed me about any. Yeah. Anyway, so, so you see what are the barriers now for understanding. Um, probably this was designed for administrators who understand these and can set this up for people. That's fine. So if it is not done for the end users, let's make it clear. But then what are we going to do for the end users? All right, um, um, I'm not saying that you know, doing things for the end users would be uh, any easier. In fact, the, the whole agenda behind um, understanding this value proposition and, and informing people, uh, and then finally getting into debate, uh, public debate, whether these sort of things should be addressed by technology or by policy and so on, is a long process. But we were thinking just from the user design point of view, what is it that we would need to do in order to uh, move from educating people to acting. And I'm just offering you here something that you may find useful in your studies. And so there is a framework that uh, has been put in place by Consola and others on uh, um, uh, communication human information processing. Uh, it's, a, it's an approach to warning and effectiveness. It's a CHIP uh, framework where suppose you want to warn somebody about a fire or warn somebody about disaster, and you want them to act. Otherwise, you get hurt. Yeah? So, so how do you design systems? And then you realize that there is a very, very complex process uh, that has to happen. Um, you are designing a communication channel from you to an individual, so you're using a number of different channels. And so, so typically what you've got is a, there's a source of information, there is a channel, and then you have to deal with the mindset of the rece uh, receiver. And so, First, you have to get their attention. So that's why we went with the real-time um, you know, information showing. Um, and then, then people have to understand what's happening. So this is the comprehension part. Uh, and even if they comprehend what's going on, you have to understand that that's falling onto their existing mindset. So they have certain attitudes and beliefs. So even if they understand what's going on still, you, there is no guarantee that anybody is going to act. So it will depend on what the artists and beliefs are. And then even if they realize that it's really contrary to all their beliefs and values, they need to be motivated to act. So you see how, how long this is. Only after all this, after you achieved all this, you may be able to observe some behavior. So and this is another warning to you. If for your PhD, you, you have to promise in your thesis what you're going to do and what you're going to measure as a success of your prototype or whatever, keep this in mind because uh, often, you know, you kind of say, I'm going to have a nice prototype, I'm going to deploy it, and I'm going to, what, measure user behavior? Please don't. Because to get to the user behavior change, see how long the process is. You may need to, in fact, design multiple uh, uh, prototypes for each of these stages to move people from one on the other. And it's not an easy, easy job to do. Okay, so let's now look at quickly uh, cookies and search. If you want, we can also discuss any of this before I move on. Okay, so the reason why we decide to look at search because everybody is using search. And uh, what is the idea? You do a search and you start clicking on the results. Question is, how many clicks do you need to do in order to get trapped? And who will be trapping you? Who will start tracking you? How many trackers are going to be on your back after a certain number of clicks? And so in order to kind of do this evaluation, we went to uh, KDD, a cup 2005, they had a nice set of queries. Of course, we, 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 you know, we repurposed the queries that were 
at that time prepared for a competition, and competition was about classification of queries. So it was really fortunate for us because um, about uh, you know, hundreds of queries were actually uh, involved in the track, and they were classified in the different categories. Some of the categories are over there. So, so sorry, Natasha, what does KDD come? Um, this is a um, one of the uh, conferences that people in computer science publishes, uh, Knowledge Discovery uh, oh, right. uh, conf Conference, it's called KDD, um, and uh, they have competitions where they would prepare data sets and then I'll, I'll release them for uh, computer scientists to um, compete for, on, on the algorithms mostly, um, to do either classification well or optimization of search well or things like that, text mining. So, this is an old one, you know, almost what, 10 years ago, but it was designed for the classification of queries at a time where people wanted to uh, guess uh, intent of the users who were searching online. So it, it was good for us. Why? Because uh, one a simple question you ask yourself, well, maybe if I'm searching for products, I'll get hit harder <laughs> by the trackers than if I go and look for my, say, text code online or health services and so on. So this was kind of a... Um, a hypothesis that was, we thought might be worth just looking at. So we picked, uh, because the classification was done manually, and whenever you have people, then they don't agree. So we went only for queries where the classification was confirmed by at least two judges. And we picked 662 queries. And these are the categories, you see, we, which we covered. So um, then we ran these queries in four different markets. Because we only sp spoke English among the researchers, so we just picked the English-speaking markets. Um, India, South Africa, United Kingdom, United States. And we picked two search engines, um, Bing and, and Google, so just to see whether it makes any difference. Um, and then we plotted a graph. Uh, so this is a network that includes uh, websites and trackers. Um, so imagine, for each of 600 queries, you get top 10 results. For each result, you go and get the trackers. And, you know, websites, of course. And then you put them in one network. And then you ask yourself, okay, I want to know, really, what is the connected component in this graph? Because that's what matters. You want to know how tightly they are knit. And so if you start moving from one website to another, who can catch you? Because it's all the information is propagating through the network, yeah? So we asked for the connected component, and this is what we got back. Um, this is a connected component of the uh, graph that we got from a Google search engine uh, in the Indian market. Okay. And uh, we said, wow, this is just a mess. Okay. So we applied a couple of clustering algorithms just to tease it up a little bit to see whether there is any substructure. And this is what we got. Um, so um, it, you can now see that if you really try to tease up uh, parts of it, that some of the websites are converting, converging more to some of the trackers. So there are some subclusters in there. Um, if you go to the US market, you get a very similar picture. Okay. So you, kind of, you almost get the f uh, feeling that it doesn't really matter. If, as long as you live on planet Earth, this is where you are. This is what you're dealing with. Uh, internationally, this is a this is really complete uh, global you know, surveillance on the web. Um, but in order to get a bit more insights, uh, I just here put a table, and I want to to focus just on the bottom part. The table shows you um, characteristics of the network for the four markets, for two search engines, and on the bottom, I'm just highlighting how big the connected component is. Uh, and so you can see that if you just look at the connected component for each of these kind of snapshots of the network, uh, the number of nodes involved is over 90 percent, um, between 92 and 93 percent. But if you look at the edges, almost you know 100 percent. You have 99 percent of the edges included in the, this connected component, which means whichever nodes are not included here, they don't matter. They are not connected really. Okay. So. Um, so anyway, the, 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 the next question is, okay, um, it's really hard to study. You saw how even visualization of that is really hard. So you can only indirectly kind of probe uh, to understand what the structure of the network is. So we decided to just to run for, for, you know, for fun, just to see whether by any chance these networks behave somehow like some of the known networks. And, and, and actually they do. 
they do uh, behave very much like a small world um, uh, networks, which means that they're extremely uh, uh, well uh, optimized for propagation of information. So um, if you do simulations um, of the uh, small um, world networks, we are using in particular uh, the was um, Stroget's random model. You can see that they very much behave like um, like the network at the probability point two of rewiring the network. It's right here. So, so they're very much aligned to what the properties would be of the small world network. And then if you take a, a, a dominant node, like a, a double-click node, then obviously it gets destabilized. So it's very interesting because these, there's obviously a um, very important role that these, some of these big, um, uh, well-connected trackers are, are playing in this network. But um, if you're thinking about whether this is a phenomenon that has happened just because there are these big players who came to the market first. I just want to show you what's happening now in the Chinese market, because you can argue this is the market that kind of evolved a bit later. Um, so we, we collected um, queries from the Baidu search engine. Um, we didn't have much time at the time when we were doing experiments, so we had only about uh, 100 queries. And I want to show you how their network evol is evolving now. Outside, you see the websites, and inside are trackers. In the Chinese market, as you know, it's not that open as, as the rest of the world. Uh, you can still find Facebooks and you know, um, double clicks and you know, Google Analytics, but there are players that are characteristics for that market, okay? and Baidu in particular, and QQ.com. So let me just show you their role. It is very, very similar to the binding that I already showed you between double click and Google Analytics. It's a very similar role. So the model is being reproduced. It's obviously a very lucrative model, um, and it's of interest uh, to whatever party is, in this case, governing the, the development of the market in China. Okay, but now going back to the main question, and that was us, about us users. So what is our faith? Okay, so your experience is you go online, you do your, your search, and you go down the first top, you know, top 10 results. Now. Uh, this is showing you the probability that uh, you are going to be uh, uh, tracked by one of the trackers. On the bottom is the, uh, on the x-axis is the number of clicks, and on y-axis is the probability. So you can tell that you know, right after you know, just five clicks, you're probably in the hands of uh, Google Analytics. Then similarly, do uh, double click. But if you follow this line, after 20, 20 clicks, there's 90% of chance that all these top 10 will track you after 30%, you are done. Okay, it's almost 100%. Okay, so, so what's the same thing is, it doesn't matter, you do using Google or using Bing, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you use any other search engine is the same. Because it's not the property of the search engine. It's not. It's the property of the web. And that's what the scary thing is. And it's, it's, it's really what we need to understand that there is a content network, and on top of it, there is a tracking network. Okay? And the content network is bugged. Okay, that's basically what it is. It's bugged. Because for every, every, everywhere you go, there is a part of the, uh, of the tracker network that gets activated. And so, you know, now you can think what, what we might be able to do with this. But that's what the internet has become. Um, if you were wondering now back to the topics, it doesn't really matter which topics you're searching on. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, less tracking happening on information uh, about, uh, you know, uh, about the law and politics and so on, uh, or information science. So maybe these websites are, are not that keen um, for free content. So maybe they don't engage with trackers that often. But yeah. All right. So this was about, about search. Any questions about this? Everyone in the <laughs> no. <laughs> Please. Yes, please. Uh, why should we, uh, be, uh, we be worried about commercial trackers when we have government tracking that works on the network layer that we cannot control? Yeah. So, so it's very interesting. We don't really know. Uh, it's just a speculation. Um, uh, the question, real question is, why, is that, why, why in this commercial world, where we typically have governments coming into place and saying, there is a you know, consumer protection, there are other things, there are no voices of that sort. They're very weak. There are people who are trying but it's not moving fast enough. 
Uh, and I, I believe that the design of technologies is not helping. So, because it's invisible. It is a plain sight, but yet it's not visible. Yeah. Um, this whole information exchange and you know, um, pointing people to URLs for, for uh, information for the, from the you know, best intent actually um, uh, uh, poses a question for our own practices. So you're very excited about the BBC News or an article in New York Times, and what do you do? You go on, on Twitter and, and you know, forward that information to your friends. Okay, so the question is, what have you done? Okay, so, yeah. So uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be Twitter. It, it, I mean, it is also worry for the corporate world. In, in emails, you're basically sending things in email to your friends. Yeah, when I look at my emails, most of the time, they have a little bit of text and three or four text, uh, you know, URLs in it. So what am I doing? Yeah. So, so in a way, it becomes a, a question about our own practice. Normally, normally, if you know that there's a danger, right, you would say, you can go there, but please turn off your cookies. Yeah? So, so in, in a way, if you protect yourself, you may want to protect others and say, look, there's a warning. But because you don't know, so you don't know yourself, and you're acting completely from the best intent you have, and there's also, also no mechanism for you to warn anybody. So that's basically what's disturbing here, that, that, the, that the design of the technology has not allowed us to understand, make the informed decision, and then act properly. Yeah. Isn't it even that sometimes when you go to websites and you have disabled some cookies, then you get these kind of general messages pop up, do you want to enable them again? Just yes. The, the whole lot without yes. any classification. Exactly. I think so, quite, it's so this even is encouraging this sort of behavior. This is the thing. The, 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 the governments have went, went along with the industry uh, and, and said, okay, we are going to inform citizens, and, it, and then there will be these pop-ups saying, this website uses cookies. Now, it's a laughable thing. It, I mean, it just happened to me regularly. So there is not even, sometimes there's no even button, okay. <laughs> it just, you can, only you can do is close it. it means you, you, you absorb the information and they can do whatever they want. They, have, they make no distinction between first party and third party cookies. So in a way, they play on that card of misinformation. Either the governments were not, who were making decisions, EU or whoever done in the UK, were not given information, or if they were given information, they decided not to acknowledge fully, and they're not presenting it. Yes. Yeah, over the last few years, there are more and more websites that warn uh, users that they're using cookies and explains what it is. Uh, is, what do you think? Is it will be is a common practice in the future for all websites, or maybe it will be required even? Mm -hmm. So it is going into that direction. There is a pressure point on on them informing the the customers. The only question is when? What is the right design of informing them? I showed you one when you have these things dropping off the page and interrupting what you're doing. Um, this is another instance where they, they, they inform you at the time where you already made the decision. So this is the problem. They, um, when you are in, interfering with the process, when the user has already made decision to engage and is expecting the value to be realized, and then you cut it off, that they, they, you redirected their attention. And at that point, they may not even have a choice. So they will accept the terms just because they have the short-term goal they need to complete. So the, back, uh, there may be a requirement that the websites need to uh, inform, and then we need to decide, we, us, designers and uh, implementers of technology, how would that be implemented? Because it's a part of the um, computer application design. It, it, it may need to be something that's a, more of a, a, a statement that has to be uh, considered before you start engaging with the internet. So it may be at the beginning of your session. Say, okay, just keep in mind, that there are trackers out there, do you want me to keep informed, or are you fine? So it, it can be a different process, but when people engage, then you're competing with their short-term goal. And then everything, all the bets are off, as you know. Uh, people uh, cannot really assess the risk, long-term risk, when they engage in a short-term gain. Yeah. It's like an automatic registration, really, somewhere. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go briefly through this. I'm not sure how much time is left. Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, 17. 17, okay. So I'll, I'll just go, uh, four or five minutes just to go over this. So you just understand a little bit the ecosystem. Um, the first is about Twitter. Just to reinforce a little bit what I said, uh, we went and um, looked at the part of the Twitter network. 
uh, based on topics and um, um, Twitter users. So imagine that you are following certain topics or you are following particular users. We managed to get a, a data set that had about 5 million um, tweets from the uh, topics and about 8 million from the users. And out of those, we just were curious to see how many of them had URLs in them. So it's not a large percentage. Uh, however, it's enough. And so, as you will see, we also studied a little bit uh, for the uh, top user data set. We, we studied a little bit who, who, which are the URLs, which domains are being tweeted about. And as you, you're guessing, lots of them, uh, things got come from YouTube. We didn't choose here, you have a, um, a shortening URLs. So I'm just putting in all in kind of raw format. Uh, but also what's interesting to look at the third parties associated with these websites. So if YouTube you're using, then it's about 12. If you're using um, some of the others, like you know, Facebook.com, about 24 trackers. But uh, the shocking one is the, the Tumblr one. But they don't get uh, alarmed. This is because Tumblr is a site which allows individuals to set up their little you know, pages and websites. And so these individuals then, each of them invites their own trackers <laughs> inadvertently, okay, because they may be introducing some content. And therefore, collectively, if you look at the Tumblr, then you have this huge number of trackers. But it also tells you that the, we are not talking about one or two or, or main, main companies. There, there are thousands of them, actually. Yeah. So, so what's happening? So first, we've done an, a social network analysis. Uh, and um, say on the topics, we picked a, a topic politics. And um, uh, when you use a, a, a social network analysis, we use Node Excel. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a plugin for Excel that it helps us also do this clustering and layout. So in this graph, people, the nodes are people. So the red nodes here are all people. It's just the red nodes are the people who tweet a lot. So um, the, the node size describes the number of followers, and the node color is uh, how many retweets. Um, there's this kind of myth that you, if you have lots of followers that you're very influential, perhaps yes. But uh, if you don't tweet much, then then you're not very influential. So, you know, so, so in a way, it's very good to also look at people who are retweeting. And in this case, they are propagating um, information and, and URLs. So the, the, the big component that I showed you, the connected component among people discussing politics, we again pulled it out a little bit. And just you can see, these are the people, only people who share tweets with URLs. So not all. So all of them are contaminating each other. So in little clusters, you see. So people are passing to each other URLs. And you can see uh, that the kind of, there is some structure there. Um, and then the question is, you know, what sort of uh, trackers are we talking about? And they're the, you know, the same suspects that we already had from the other, except, except here I'm showing you <clears throat> what happens when you are uh, sharing your eyes in social media. Yeah, so if you're looking at uh, your eyes with third parties, um, uh, how many URLs were actually associated with them? Like 65% actually were associated with Google Analytics in this case, and 56% to Facebook, and then also um, in the, 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 the third party domains, uh, 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 how many users were actually exposed? So 66% of users who were exposed were exposed to these trackers. Okay, uh, Google Analytics, 58 to double click, 57 to google.com, and so on. Okay, so we just wanted to get some idea uh, what happened to us uh, when, when we share URLs. Uh, assumption is, of course, that you actually went to see the URL, or you went to see it before you, you include it into your tweet. So, yeah. All right, so let me just go quickly. This is the last bit. This is now understanding the ecosystem of the trackers themselves. Okay, so um, these nodes now are all trackers. We just want to understand a little bit the types of them. Uh, the little nodes are neglig ne negligible here. These are websites. Based on these 20 websites, I just looked who are the trackers associated with 20 websites. Okay? The reason we looked at these 20 websites is because in a previous study, when we did this in international search, they were present everywhere. The websites were present in the top uh, 10 results, and the trackers were there. So there are three categories of trackers. The, we are already familiar with the Tracker trackers, the people who are bidding and um, um, uh, you know, uh, have exchange for advertising, that's, that's the red ones. 
Um, but also there are companies that are affiliated with this bidding process. They don't track anybody, they just deliver ads. So these are the green ones. Okay, so you have red guys who are really the brokering uh, the whole process and then the green ones the delivering ads, whatever. And then there are the blue ones. Okay, and the blue ones are really tricky because from the design point of view, there is a kind of dual value proposition. Those are the websites that you actually see. You go them actively, you have subscription to them. You have engagement with them, okay? They have dual roles. So when you see little F, little T, little L on the web, web, web pages everywhere, the F for you know, Facebook uh, um, icon and Twitter icon and so on, and you see them everywhere. Why is that? Well, they're tracking devices. So whenever you land on the website which has F and T, Twitter is informed immediately. Now, it's okay, you know, they inform immediately, but if you are logged into them, then they know who you are. Okay, so, so, so what, actually what we are doing now, we are moving from anonymous tracking based on some kind of fingerprinting of your laptop, which is also bad, yeah, and all the other things, to actually knowing who you are. So whatever you do is not anonymous anymore. Uh, as you will see here, these are the similar, um, just show you how, how, how it works. So in this case, it's eHow. And it's connected with some of the uh, blue one, green one, and red one. The same thing with double click, connected with, with all of them, the bl blue one and green one and red one, okay? So it's, uh, it's very interesting um, to see how the connection among the trackers work. But if you are in advertising, what would you do? Well, you look at the picture like this and you say, oh, well, here's a demand and supply. What is it to worry about? Uh, I have demand, I have people who want to advertise, I have websites. That's the supply of places for advertising, okay? So demand, people, you may be BMW. BMW has its own website, but BMW wants to advertise everywhere. So BMW is in the, on the demand side now and says, I want to advertise, who can advertise my stuff? And then, of course, the exchange server gets involved and says, I've got a customer. I just track this customer. I know where they've been. Maybe a good chance to, to, to go there. So what we have seen from our... Um, uh, analysis, we have seen what's happening on the supply side. We have seen websites where the, the advertising actually gets um, implemented. That's where the supply is. So we've, we've seen how the websites inform the exchange. We've seen how exchange and brokers with the green sites to get the advertising in. And the consumer gets the value, right? Better advertisements. Okay. So what I'm basically saying, you can do computer science, as we've done. Uh, empirical study and so on, there is a whole economic model behind. And it's enabled through our technology. And the consumer is there and knows nothing. Thanks to our designs. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. I think that has given us a lot of food for thought. <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be some questions as well to follow up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it's very interesting. Uh, the advertising business itself is very interesting. Uh, the holy grail of any company is not to have tracking mechanism. The holy grail of New York Times or L'Oreal or um, EasyJet is actually to have a direct relationship with the customer. And what has happened is the intermediaries, the reason why we have intermediaries who are now sniffing, uh, enabling um, um, tracking across websites is because none of these individual companies can do that tracking. None of them can actually get to the masses of people easily. So, so if you have a mechanism by which we can enable more intimate relationship between the vendors and the consumers directly, then this intermediary thing is gone. So we can think of some other creative ways by which the, ad, the, the, the vendors uh, can actually engage with customers. And there are many more coming up. You just look at now, uh, the practices are changing. People are Skyping, people are you know, um, linking on Facebook and so on. We just need to think about are there, are there any technological um, um, innovation that we can put in place to replace this sort of advertising? Because if they are pressed, it will be very interesting to see what the effectiveness is. Yeah. So they all claim effectiveness in their own, in their own um, ecosystem. 
but not us. We, 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 didn't, we are outside it. And uh, they have very, very fuzzy metrics about uh, how successful they are. You know, whether we glance on something, whether we click on something, whether we actually converge with the, our uh, purchase and so on. So, so in a way, um, they have fuzzy metrics and they are happy in that world because the money is changing hands and that's all fine. So one answer is, let's look at the technology, be creative, let's think. All we need to worry about is this time, next time we citizens want to be part of it. Okay? So that's the, that's the, the role. The second thing is, um, we, do, do, we do have some chance to negotiate with the governments because we are set as the citizens of the countries where, uh, at least in some cultures, the, the privacy is valued. So we may be able to push some of that. Um, so whatever we come up with, how do you know that the middleman wouldn't get involved anyway? I mean, it's just the nature of technology. Yeah. I mean, they have a direct stake at making money just yeah. like everyone else. They always will. You're right. They always will. Just look at the stock market. <laughs> it's exactly. about the whole world, and you can't stop it. The question only is whether we enable, in the next round, we help people be empowered more. Because at the moment, at the moment, we have no say. This is, I always I phrase this, this is very drastic, but it is the case. When do you remember, in the history of humanity, people didn't have any right and didn't have any choice? Okay? I only remember one, it was slavery. No rights, no choice. It's horrible. Uh, the question is, it's not a legislation problem. I mean, cannot we, it's not something that we must simply decide that it is not, it should not be allowed to, to get all our history and use it for commercial use and to delete ourselves in some manner. It's not something that the government and our people must decide. It's, I mean, can we act like a computer scientist and say, okay, our new technologies will be, will be protecting other people from using, but it should be something that we agree, all agree on. You know. uh, so the question is really whether, what is the role of computer science in this, right? I mean, uh, we computer scientists are creating innovation, innovative technologies. It could be used in one way or in another way. Uh, we cannot, when the browser was designed, people didn't think that this is going to happen. Um, so the question only is how we computer scientists engage with the rest of the society. Um, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure at the university that you have uh, ethical committees and so on. Whenever you wanted to run a study, there would be somebody on your back asking you whether you're paying attention to this and that. We, as, as, as really the community that is creating technologies, and, and believe me, people on the street cannot write programs. And if we do not design systems that then understand what programs are doing, in some way, we have an ultimate power. <laughs> this is really, because we put this... Um, we put these technologies and, and masses are using them. And, and, and so, so the question is only that we have certain responsibility when we, when we do this because we don't live in vacuum. Computer science is not in vacuum. There are economical factors that are around that will jump on it. How do we engage with the broader society to have this conversation before these sort of things happen? I don't know. I do not know what the forums will be. But if you raise the, the questions, this is almost trivial. What I'm showing you today, by the way, is nothing. This is the tip of the iceberg. The next, next thing, when maybe next time I talk to you, I'll show you what happens with, with JavaScript that they embed in the pages. It's just, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, it's not just about your, your ca uh, browser cache, it's going to be your proxy. So God help you then, because it's, it's outside your computer. Yeah, anyway. So, so I agree with this. Uh, we, we need to think about the mechanism to engage with the society and think about responsibility. Please. Um, this tracking, the, the way you're talking about tracking now, is mostly for ads. Is there anything else? Because ads, aside from the fact that, you know, I, I agree that it, it looks a bit scary, still I have a feeling, okay, yeah. I'm not too bothered about it, yeah. but I can imagine that there is another way that tracking is used that is a lot more harmful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so the reason why we consumers don't have much power is ex exactly this, because we can't prove that there is harm. <laughs> so somebody says, okay, so what? Now you know what I, that I like. You know, this type of boots are not on the other. So you, you cannot really argue that there is harm. But in fact, we are talking about privacy, where um, the, there is no grand uh, risk or challenge, perhaps. However, I can tell you, if my daughter goes and 
this, do some searching online and it just happened that I'm using the computer and can see that some ads are coming up, I'll ask the question. And she would not like it. Uh, and it's not about her being harmed on the street, it's about you know, not being able to go out with friends or anything. So you get grounded for you know, <laughs> no reason or good reason. Uh, so the privacy is very interesting because it's not like security. However, there are companies that will be worried about this. There are these scenarios that there will be big worry about it, especially if you're not just looking at advertising. Uh, when you're looking at these attacks through JavaScript, it's enterprises that are subject to the business espionage. Because you don't have to be Google and double click or anybody. You can be anybody and do, e exploit the, vulner the, the vulnerability of the system at the moment. So I, my bet is actually that, again, citizens will be taken care of for wrong reasons, if you wish, not because of the human rights uh, or their rights for privacy uh, as a value, but because the companies are going to be uh, harmed because there will be information leaking um, to the same mechanism that we individuals are being exposed to. I mean, reduce demands will reduce supply, right? Yes. So you, it's just the question is how do you um, manage the ad, blocking the ads? Yeah. Because I think Google Chrome automatically installs AdBlock at the moment. I'm not yes. sure about Internet Explorer and Firefox, but yeah. I mean, if everyone does that, the chain will collapse, right? Exactly. So this is exactly you're right. So those edges that are coming into the network will be cut off. So we do have some control in yes. this entire graph. But we need a. Unified action, right? Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> the thing is that the, you see, the, the, they already prevent uh, the p companies are already thinking ahead. So what's happening is now you have the whole operating system. You have so you have the whole browser being designed, and in the hands of the main companies that are uh, in fact participating in the, in, in the economic system. So you know you have to. Uh, they, they, they're anticipating reactions, so they are already repositioning themselves. So. It's going to be an ongoing thing, just like with security. It will never stop. And it was said before, there will be always a middleman. And the only question is, how can we count? Basically, that's the question. Can we count? Yeah. OK, thank you very much, Natasha. You're welcome.